being here. Special welcome to all of our guests that are in the house today. And uh, it's nice uh, that we're, we got a little bit of, of breathing room here with the weather that we can, we can actually get out a little bit. It's not so freezing cold. I appreciate that. If you're online with us, thanks for being here as well. Uh, we're glad that you were able to join us digitally and uh, hope that you enjoy today as well. We're in a series right now and we're actually following up on a message series from last month that was called Pray, uh, Read, Pray, Fast. And so we're in another three-part series now called The Armor of God. And this one is about spiritual warfare. Because the truth is that when we do those things like pray and we read our Bible and when we fast, we're actually doing spiritual warfare, whether we, we realize uh, all of the, the effects of it or not. Um, so we're, we're battling against the kingdom of darkness as representatives of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God as his sons and daughters, really. So we can't lose sight of the fact that we are under attack as we're working to spread the gospel, as we're working to advance God's kingdom, that we are in a spiritual battle and we're under attack. But it's easy to get caught up in our day-to-day -day life and lose sight of that, right? Maybe you've been there, I've been there, where you get so caught up in the day-to-day -day and the job and the kids and all those things that you forget that we're in a cosmic supernatural battle against the enemy. But remember, this is important because our spiritual lives are really on the line and we have an enemy that doesn't want to just bother us or annoy us or just try to discourage us. He actually wants to kill us. He does all those other things but like bother and distract and annoy, but, but ultimately his goal is to kill us, is to separate us from our God. We're reminded of this throughout Scripture. In the New Testament, we see some of the apostles uh, emphasize this. Uh, in 1 Peter 5, what we read last week is, stay alert. He warns us, Peter warns us, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And then we get that echoed in James chapter 4, James being the little brother of Jesus who was close to Peter and they kind of ran the, the, the church there in Jerusalem after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. And James also chimes in and says in verse 7, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. So how can we actually resist the devil? How can we possibly stand up against all the stuff that he and the world throws at us uh, every day and, and still expect to, to come out of this em emerging victorious? Uh, not just trying to get by, not just trying to hold our head above water, but actually trying to thrive as a follower of Christ. Like, is that even possible? Can we truly thrive and live in that abundance and that blessing? Or are we just trying to get by? Well, on our own, there's no way to have victory. There's no way to overcome the enemy. That's why we need God to help us. And that's exactly what he does. And one of the major ways that he helps us is by providing weapons, or we could say tools, for us to grab hold of and to use. So let's go back to the book of Ephesians. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians 6. It'll be on the screen as well. And we're going to continue looking at the armor of God as we move into part two here of our three-part message series. So Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Remember, the, the devil does have schemes. Remember, we talked football last week, and I know some of you have already brought up the 49ers, and I don't want to talk about it, so we're going to move on from it. But you have schemes. You look at the tape of the other teams and how they play. You look at their strengths and weaknesses. The devil does the same thing with us. He looks at our strengths and weaknesses, what our tendencies are. He has schemes against us. So Paul tells us, make sure you have on all of your armor so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. 
Verse, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's not against people. Our real battle is not against one another. It's not against your boss at work. It's not against your family members. It's not against any person. It's really against the enemy. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. And here's where he gets into these different Uh, this metaphor of these different pieces of armor. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We're going to stop there today as we're going to cover some of these. Last week, we covered the first two pieces of armor that are mentioned, the belt of truth, and the breastplate of righteousness. So today we're going to look at two more, and then we'll finish up uh, in our final message next week with the last two. Uh, We're going to look at these two pieces that Paul describes, and then we'll just unpack them and look at some of the truths of these metaphors. And so just like last week, my goal for us today is that we will leave here with some practical ideas on how we can fight these spiritual battles, how we can we can keep our, our joy and peace and have victory in our lives uh, in the middle even of diff- difficult circumstances, of uncertainty, of things that are going on, the heaviness of life. And it's my hope that we can also learn how to together push back the darkness in our lives as we continue to move forward, continue to pursue the Lord and grow in relationship with Him. Because that's really the ultimate goal is that we would grow closer to God, that we would know Jesus in a deeper way. So let's take a look at these pieces of of armor, this metaphor that Paul uses. First we have, uh, well, it's actually number three since we started last week with one and two. It's the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Remember in verse 15, he said, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So this, this piece of armor that I'm calling the, the shoes, it's kind of like the belt. Because when you think of a suit of armor, your first thought probably isn't the belt, and it's probably not the shoes either. You don't normally think of that as a piece of armor, right? It, it's not the most important part, you would think, just right off, right off the bat. However, imagine that you have this soldier, imagine a an ancient soldier like a Roman soldier, and he's got all of his armor on. He's got his breastplate. He's got his sword and his helmet and his shield, and he's looking good, and he's barefoot. That wouldn't work, right? He may, he may have everything together, but if he doesn't have the right shoes on, as our military people know, that's a big problem. You can't really get very far if you don't have the right shoes. Imagine a Roman soldier walking around in Crocs, That wouldn't work, right? Now, if my daughter was a Roman soldier, she would be wearing Crocs, but but that wouldn't really work. If you've ever had a bad pair of shoes, anybody ever have a bad pair of shoes that you just, you tried it on at the store maybe, or you ordered it online and you, you get them and you're like, yeah, this could work. And then you get them, you're walking around in them and you're like, what did I do? They're so tight or they just never feel comfortable or they're hard. It's just a problem. Shoes are important. If you've got chronic foot pain like I do, you know about shoes making a big difference in your day and how things are going to go. So this is actually pretty important. Just think about a modern soldier in, in, our, in our military. One of the last things that you want to deal with in the middle of a fight is worrying about where you're going to step. And, and if it's dangerous or not. So the military has some pretty serious boots that they, they give out to our soldiers so that they can, they can step where they need to step and don't worry about it and, and live in fear that the terrain isn't going to be good. And so they can, they can really keep their full attention on the battle at hand. There's a reason why soldiers don't wear Crocs or flip-flops. There's a, there's a big reason. So that's the shoes part of this metaphor. But what is, 
What is Paul talking about when he says the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace? Well, the, the original Greek that this letter was written in, that Paul wrote it in, there's a, the word that we translate as gospel, and it just simply means good news. So what is the good news? Well, the, it's the good news of God's plan of salvation for mankind. That is the good news. That's the gospel. And in the end, this plan that he has is going to bring peace to the whole world. There's some things that happen first that are not very peaceful. But, it, but in the end, God's plan is to bring peace to the world. And so it's this message that God's people are trying to share and trying to, to get out there with others. So we have the shoes and we have this gospel of peace. Okay, so what, what do they have to do with each other? Well, it's interesting. If you look at another one of Paul's writings, we actually see that this reference to shoes isn't just some random metaphor that Paul uses. Look at Romans 10 Verse 13, he's explaining this process here. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 14, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, and then he quotes Isaiah 52 here, and he says, that is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. Interesting, right? That Paul, he's tied this analogy to Old Testament prophecy, to the book of Isaiah, that there's this idea that, that the shoes, the feet, that that is what carries the message of the good news, the gospel. So the shoes, or as, as it said, the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, that is a long title, it's really about the church being commissioned to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom, to spread God's message of peace and of salvation all around the world. So having our shoes on means that we're ready to go, we're ready to move and to go share the good news to advance the kingdom of God at any moment that we stand ready. We're like soldiers ready to be deployed. Now, today it's a little bit different than it was in Paul's day because obviously uh, transportation has changed and communication has changed. But we also, we have to be ready to do our part in spreading the gospel message and to do it without being afraid like Paul talked about. Jesus, when he was on earth, he, uh, he was talking to his 72 disciples. He had an inner group of three, and then he had his 12 that he traveled everywhere with. But then he had also others. I don't know if you know that, but there was a point where he had 72 that he was going to send out to go preach the gospel, to uh, preach the kingdom of God, and to do miracles, healings, casting out demons, and so he commissions them and he tells them in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That's a pretty amazing commission there. And some people, unfortunately, have taken this extremely literally and kind of taken it overboard and have, have invited trouble into their lives. They've gotten... You, anybody ever heard of a snake handling church? You, maybe you've never heard of that. If you haven't, just good. Don't look it up. It's, it's, not, it's not us, okay? But, but they take this as like, okay, well, we have ultimate authority given by Jesus, so we're going to go get some snakes and we're going to handle them or we're going to stomp on scorpions. And that's not what Jesus is getting at here. He's commissioning them with authority. Yes, they have that power that if that situation were to arise, that he would give them the power like he did with Paul when he got shipwrecked and he was bitten by, I think it was a viper, and he didn't die. He was okay. But we don't go looking for trouble, okay? And that's kind of like just a little side I want to just mention to you real quick, that in this context of spiritual warfare, 
We are not going and looking for trouble. We're not trying to go stir things up everywhere we go and take on every battle. That's not the point. We don't ever want to lose focus that this is about Jesus. Our lives are are about serving him. But we need to be prepared for battle. We need to realize the enemy is attacking us. And sometimes we'll come upon a situation where that authority that Jesus gave his followers will come into play. Okay? So he commissions them to to not be afraid. And so the the shoes are a symbol of that, that I'm going to go and I'm not going to be afraid wherever the Lord leads me to share the kingdom of God. But not only that, not only do the shoes empower me to not be afraid, but they also make my life not all about me, that the focus of my life isn't all about me. They help me focus on other people, on other needs, and about getting them connected to Jesus. Because if you don't have the right shoes or if you don't have any shoes, you're going to be pretty fixated on your own condition all the time. You're going to be very careful where you step, and you're going to kind of live in paranoia. And it might be too hot or too cold or too rough or any number of things that you could get injured. But if you have the right shoes on, like like around here, we get a lot of snow. So if you have good snowshoes, you don't have to think about the snow all the time. You can go out and in it. You can walk in it. You can hike in it. You can shovel in it, whatever you need to do if you have the right snowshoes on. But imagine if you don't. One of my daughters likes to go out in the snow in her little basketball slides, like, like sandals, flip-flops. And I, I keep telling her, you can't do that. And she'll come back in with snow all over her socks. And what are you doing? But she doesn't care, right? She goes out and she's not prepared. So she can slip. She can get hypothermia. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. But we don't have fear and we don't focus all on ourselves when we have this commission, these shoes. That's a big part of the armor of God. So here's the the challenge question for this piece of armor for these shoes. When was the last time I shared my faith with someone? If If you're here today or you're with us online and you are a follower of Jesus and maybe even for a long time... Just just stop for a second and ask yourself, when was the last time I shared my faith with someone? Remember, this is not some kind of sales competition. This is not where you have to make people sign a thing or convert to something. You're just sharing your faith, your experience with the Lord. When was the last time I did that? And then the other question is, am I willing to step outside of my comfort zone to do this? You notice how we, we use that phrase, step out of my comfort zone, We never think about the word step. But what does it take to step? It takes feet, right? And it takes shoes. That's how we step out of our comfort zone. So am I willing to do that? Something for you to think about and just kind of wrestle with this week a little bit. So that's the shoes of the gospel of peace. Now let's look at the second item, the shield of faith. This is a big one. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. See, up until now, there's a little bit of a shift here because up until now, Paul is describing the armor of God and basically being limited to things that we wear. Things that we put on our, our body and they stay there like the belt or the, the breastplate and the shoes. They get fastened to our body and we don't really have to think about them a lot. But the shield is different. Paul says that the shield is something that we actually have to take up. We, we have to, to raise it. If we just strap it to our arm, that's not going not gonna to do it. That's not going to do any good if we don't actually make the effort to use it, to hold it up as, as the shield. And I think it's, it's cool. It's so cool how Paul did this metaphor because if we understand his context, it really adds a richness to what he's saying Because Paul would have been referring to, in this scripture, to a Roman shield. And so the Romans used this specific shield called the scutum. So let me show you that on the screen. Show them the the scutum, scutum shield. And this wasn't just your standard little medieval round shield that maybe you're thinking of when you think of a shield. This was actually a really large 
slightly curved on the edges, rectangular shield that had a large metal knob in the middle on the outside there, and it, yeah, in the center. And I love what they called this metal knob, this angry little knob sitting there. Anybody know what they called it? The boss. Isn't that cool? This was called the boss. I, I love it. I just think that was definitely one of the soldiers that came up with that, right? So I want to show you a little bit, uh, just a little 30-second clip of Gladiator, the movie, where they, they use these Skewdom shields, and you can kind of see how they played a big part in the warfare and in their dominance of taking over the world um, back in the day. So show them the, the little clip from Gladiator. So Gladiator is one of my favorite movies of all time. I recommend it for sure. But you can see in this clip that they are dominating with those types of weapons. And in the movie, they totally decimate uh, the barbaric uh, army that they were fighting against. And Rome took over. That was like the last outpost to take over. And they were supposed to be going into a time of peace. So these amazing shields, that's what Paul would have known, what he would have seen. So why would he then say to take up this shield of faith? What's the faith part? What is he talking about? Well, simply put, if we want to define faith, it's just trust or confidence or reliance on something or someone. Now, we get a biblical definition from Hebrews 1. The writer says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And one of the greatest examples of faith in all of the Bible is from the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 3. And you have these three young men, these young teenagers really, who were, they, their country Israel had been captured and they'd been exiled to Babylon. And they're kind of prisoners there and they're facing possible execution by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. So he wants them to bow before this idol of himself that he had made, not exactly the most humble guy, but he wanted everybody in the kingdom to bow before this, this idol, and they wouldn't do it. So this is what they said in Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. That's pretty bold. And I love verse 18. This is my favorite. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. I love that. And that could be a whole nother message for a whole nother day about God can deliver me and he will deliver me. But even if he doesn't, I'm not doing it. I'm not bowing. Talk about faithfulness. I think that's probably, it's got to be up there in the, the best examples of faith in the Bible. So their faith in God allowed them to stand up to, at the time, who was the, the world's most powerful man and refuse to bow down. And they said, we only worship the one true God. So, of course, they were then thrown into the furnace. And that should be the end of the story. But they were miraculously delivered by God. That they were in the furnace and they weren't burning up. Incredible. Now, as a church kid, I always have weird questions. So my weird question that has nothing to do with anything is just, was it hot? I don't know. Think about it. You can't really answer that question because they were inside the fire and they weren't burning. So maybe it wasn't even hot. I don't know. I'm going to find out one day, though. I like useless information. So they were thrown into the fire. God saved them. And their faith was so strong that they were willing to lay down their lives if necessary. 
course, they didn't want to, but they were willing. It's like they, they had proof or evidence of something that wasn't seen. That is true faith. So it's the shield of faith. So what does a shield do, really? Well, first thing is a shield deflects. This scutum shield, it was a really effective defensive weapon because of its large size. Some were like three and a half feet tall by three feet wide or so. And the soldiers, if they were really hidden behind it, they were protected. And because of the, the curve on the outside, it was really effective in deflecting attacks. It wasn't flat, so things would just hit right into it and you would have to absorb the force. It would, it would deflect, it would glance off if it was an arrow or something like that, that they were being attacked with. So remember in verse 16 um, of Ephesians 6 that he, he says, Paul says to take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So figuratively speaking and spiritually speaking, the enemy, Satan is firing fire arrows at us intending to burn us up, to destroy us. He's always shooting these arrows of fear and doubt and anxiety and worry. But the only time that they can really hurt us is when we have our shield and we let it down. Then we're vulnerable to these arrows. When we stop believing that God is sovereign, when we stop believing that God really is working behind the scenes, it's like taking the shield and putting it down. It's like stopping, stopping believing that, that if we trust him, that whatever happens is for our good. It's for the good of his kingdom, even if it doesn't feel like it or it doesn't seem that way at first. That's when we put down the shield. We start to believe that God's not moving. He's not acting. That I can't trust him. You know, the enemy's been doing this for a long time. He fired arrows at Jesus' disciples all the time, especially Peter, because Peter was kind of the leader. He was out front a lot. And so the enemy really went after him. And there's one story that maybe you're familiar with where Jesus was walking on, wide, on water and the disciples were out in a boat. And so let's look at that story real quick in Matthew 14, 28. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Faith, right? Nobody's ever done that before, but he believed. So verse 29, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. Remember, this isn't just a little stream. They're out on the lake. He's walking on water. But then there's verse 30, the word but. There's always a but, isn't there? But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? See what happened here? Peter started in the boat with his shield up like this. And then he started walking on the water and he thought, wait, I can't do this. This isn't right. And the enemy started shooting arrows of doubt and he put his shield down and he got hit and he started to sink. And so the Lord told him, you just, you, you, you didn't, you put your shield down. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why'd you do that? Why'd you make yourself vulnerable? You, you could have you walked all the way to me. Just keep your shield up. But that's what the enemy wants to do. He did it to Peter. He wants to do it to us. So a shield deflects those arrows. The second thing is a shield actually attacks. Remember that really cool thing in the middle of the shield, that metal knob called the boss? Yeah, that allowed the soldiers to actually use their shield as a forward advancing weapon to knock the enemy back and to open the, the enemy up for further attack. They were knocked on their heels and then you could advance further. And it's kind of like that with our shield of faith that, that we, can, we can knock the enemy back, can knock Satan and his plans 
backwards so that we have a chance to fight back. Fight back by doing the work of God, by obeying Him, by working in His plan. Because God tells us that our faith can't really just be um, in our hearts or just in our minds. It can't be something that we just talk about out of our mouths. Faith has to result in something. What do you think faith has to result in? Action. Faith act- has to actually get legs and walk. It, it has to move. It can't just be talked about. And there's so much in scripture about that. In James that we read from earlier, this little brother of Jesus, he talks about this a lot because he grew up with Jesus. I mean, he's not impressed by people. He's not impressed by any religious talk. You know, he's not impressed by church. So he just cuts to the core of things. And, and I actually really like his, his book because of that. He says in James 2, he takes the gloves off and he says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? We've talked about that a few times over the years here, about about how you believe in God. Good. Great. But it's not about believing in God, because Satan himself and all his demons believe in God. They They know about him more than we do. But they won't be in heaven one day. People say that in our culture all the time, right? Oh, I believe in God. Well, James would say, who cares? It doesn't matter. Because Satan himself does. So this shield of faith is really meant to be used. It's meant to be acted upon. We don't just talk about our faith or about all the the great things that the Lord has given to us. No, we put them into practice. So a shield deflects, a shield attacks shield moves. And then lastly is a shield protects. Obviously, a Roman uh, shield would protect that single soldier if he kind of hides behind it and he wouldn't get struck by the enemy. But it even served a greater purpose when these shields were joined together with other soldiers. So they created this strategy that's pretty amazing. The, The Roman military, uh, they made use of these large seal shields. So when the enemies would, would start firing the barrage of arrows, and they'd start maybe throwing spears at the Roman army, the soldiers would tighten up and close ranks and form this very special rectangular formation that they called the testudo. So let me show you that. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's the word for tortoise. They would, they would turtle up, basically. And it was impenetrable. Uh, those on the outside of the formation would, would use their shields to create this wall around the sides. And then those in the middle that would raise their shields over their heads and they would protect everybody from things flying in from above. So the result is what you see. It's kind of like this, this medieval tank that if they move together, if they practice this enough, the enemy couldn't get in. There was hardly anything they could do. So we saw a little bit of that in Gladiator Uh, where they would go one man in front, one man behind, and the front man would put it forward and the back man would put it up. But look at this little clip, another 30-second clip from a movie that just shows us what happens when they form this testudo. Go ahead. So they could make the enemy waste all of their, their arrows and everything they had, and then they could break ranks, and then they, they could attack and move forward. And so 
there's this imagery as well in, in this armor, this metaphor that Paul uses. And he talks a lot about in other places about the unity of the body of Christ, unity working together. So it's not just about having your own personal shield. It's about understanding the dynamics of being a part of a community of faith and how we're stronger when we're together. We look back at uh, Ephesians, but look, go back two chapters from where we've been in chapter six. Go back to chapter four. Paul says that he, speaking of Jesus, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Now lay that over the image of, of this little turtle that we had. He makes the whole body fit together per- perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, when the Roman army joined its shields together, it became almost an unstoppable force. And if we in the church join our shields together, in other words, that we we strengthen each other, that we encourage one another, we sharpen one another, we serve one another, if we do these things, we too can be an unstoppable force. The church that Jesus prayed that we would be one. One of Jesus' few unanswered prayers. It hasn't come to pass yet. Lord, I pray that they would be one. Well, are we one? Are are all the churches in the world one? Not even close, right? But the power that's there, that's available to us by joining our shields, joining our faith together together. So I ask you, how strong is your faith? Do you know what God says? Do you know what he promises his people in the Bible? Are you standing on those promises? Or are you doing kind of like Peter did and you're letting your shield down and you're giving in to fear or you're giving in to doubt or worry? Maybe you you would say something like, you know, I'm just afraid. I'm just anxious about the future and about what's going to happen. And and I just can't escape it. It's just consuming me. Well, do you know what the word says in Philippians 4? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Stand on that. Put your shield up on that, that you don't have to live in anxiety. Well, I'm just worried about finances. You know, I just, I don't know if I have enough to pay the bills. You know, I have all these goals and I'm going to have to get another job because I want to get this and I want to move money here. And it's just money, money, money. And I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I got to figure this out. I got to work and I got to make it happen. Because if I don't, I, I, I don't know if I'll even be able to afford what I have. Well, do you know verse 19 of Philippians 4? And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Put your shield up on that, that it's not you who provides. It's the Lord when you trust in him. It means you might not have all the luxuries. You might not have it all under control and and have everything you ever wanted, but the Lord will provide for you. And you don't have to worry. Well, I just don't know if I can open up. I know that that I'm supposed to open up to people and to the Lord. But, you know, I've been really hurt before. And just people don't understand what I've been through. And so I'm kind of closed off. Well, where's your shield of faith? Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He understands what you've gone through. He is close to you. Put your shield of faith up on that promise. That he is close. Well, I just feel so alone. You know, everybody seems to have abandoned me in my life. And so it's hard for me to trust because I I just don't, I just think people are going to let me down. And I just feel so alone. Remember Hebrews 13, 5, that the Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know what forsake means? It means to abandon. Some of us have actually been abandoned in life. There are people that battle with that their whole life. 
maybe they've been adopted or different situations where they, they feel like somebody gave up on them, but the Lord never will do that. Never. So put up your shield of faith and know that you are not alone, that he hasn't abandoned you, hasn't left or maybe you'd say, yeah, I'm just stuck in life because I just, I just don't know where to go. I don't know what decision to make. I'm sort of paralyzed. I've got all these roads in front of me, but, but I, I don't know. I, I'm just stuck. Well, put your shield of faith up on Psalm 37, 23, that the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Did you get that? That not only does he direct your steps, but he enjoys knowing all about the details of your life. The details, the little things that we would never think to bring to God. He's going, hey, what is that about? What is it? What is it you're thinking? What are you wanting to do? What are you picking out? What are you deciding? What do you need help with? The Lord delights in the details of your life. Put your shield up. Put your shield up. And move forward as he leads you. You don't have to be stuck. And then one more passage to share with you. It's really the, the passage that's gotten me through a lot of things in my life. The different crises that I've had to face. Big decisions or grief or when I'm afraid or when I'm angry or frustrated. Or when I'm trying to figure something out about the road ahead and I just can't. Have you ever been there? Where you just don't know what to do. Whatever option you seem to choose just isn't great. I always go back to this scripture ever since I was in high school, actually. I remember reading this and this kind of became my verse because so, it has so much in it. But it's just Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. To trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know what I like to tell people who are dealing with relationship stuff and they're wondering, when am I going to get married? When am I going to find somebody? I like to just switch these words a little bit and I say, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Trust him with it. Give him your heart. Trust him with your heart. Trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's where I have a hard time. Because I like to tell the Lord, Lord, this doesn't make sense. I'm the only one, I guess, right? No one else has done that, but just me. I like to say, Lord, can you just kind of chart it out here for a little bit so I can walk the road instead of just giving me this flashlight with the batteries from the dollar store that are on their last leg where I can barely see a dim reflection. Can you give me a little bit more? But he says, don't go by what you understand. Don't look at your situation and think that you can figure it all out. If I tell you something to do, I am going to chart that course for you, but I'm not going to do it all at once. I'm going to give it to you in pieces. Why? That's frustrating. Yes, but you'll depend on me more. You'll be in relationship with me instead of just taking the plan and running with it and destroying it. You'll ruin it if I give it all to you now. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. All your ways, submit to him. What does submit mean? It means to come under the mission of submission. I submit to you. I'm coming under God's mission in your life. You submit to me. You're coming under God's mission in my life. So in all your ways, come under the mission of God. And he will make your path straight. He will chart the course. So I always get a little uncomfortable when people say, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? I mean, I take it a week at a time. I feel like, like uh, that's hard to answer because years ago, I gave God a blank check. And I said, here you go, Lord. What do you want? What do you want? It's wide open. I don't have any stipulations. I don't have any earmarks. I don't have any asterisks. It's just a blank check, whatever you want to do. So that's why this verse has been such part of the core of who I am. It keeps my faith alive. It's the food. The word is the food for it, that I trust in him through all things. And I don't look at 
my own understanding. I submit to him and then I let him chart the course. So I encourage you, encourage all of us, including myself, let's hold up the shield of faith. Let's hold it up. Let's be men and women of God who stand up with courage and defend against the enemy who use it as a weapon to push back darkness, just like, just like Jesus did in the desert when he was being tempted. He fought back with faith and with the word of God, said, no, enemy, you're not, you're not, you, I'm not giving in to your temptations. So here's the challenge questions for the shield. Is there a situation in my life where I'm operating out of fear more than faith? Is there a situation in my life where I'm operating more out of fear than faith. So if that's the case, if you answered, yeah, there's, there's one area, yeah, there's a, there's a thing where I'm, I know what I'm supposed to do, but uh, I'm afraid. So then instead of trying to bite off everything at once, the question then is, what next step do I need to take this week? What's the, just the next step in that journey? So this is a lot. It's a lot to process that we're in a spiritual battle, that we have weapons. But this is also very real and very important for us, for you, for me as individuals, but also for our church, because the enemy doesn't like what's going on. The enemy doesn't like that we're stirring up a spiritual hunger and a vitality here. He doesn't like that. So I told you last week that don't expect this, this week to be easy. And I know I've talked to a couple of you that said, yeah, this was a hard week. Anybody else? You had a hard week this week after coming last week? Anybody would say, yeah, this was a rough week for me. Yeah, a couple of us. Yeah, so realize we're in a battle here. And if we try to push into the Lord, if we try to advance his kingdom, the enemy is going to get his strategy and his schemes together. So we don't have to be afraid. We just have to be aware. We have authority over him. We have authority of anyth over anything that the enemy would do. So let's walk in that truth. Can we stand together? Let's be a church that gathers in that formation, that testudo formation, that we protect one another, that our eyes are forward, that we're not just fixated on one another and on our petty differences or our traditions, or our preferences, but that we have eyes fixed on Jesus and on his mission to advance the gospel in this world, to be people of tremendous faith. I'm still believing that we are going to see incredible miracles right before our eyes, healings, miraculous things that there's no other explanation for. I'm holding on to that. But it's going to take all of us Pursuing the Lord in prayer, in worship, engaging the scripture. Let's commit to be those kind of people. Can we pray? Lord, we want to be the people you created us to be. We want to be a church that understands what it means to work in unity, in harmony with one another. A church that understands what it means to defend not, not defend some human thing or some political thing or some ideology, but to defend against our enemy who's trying to take us down, who's trying to kill us, trying to divert us away from you and from your goodness and from your promises. So we use your word, we stand on your word, and we raise our shield of faith and we put on those shoes that will carry us to places that maybe are uncomfortable for us. And we just take up courage. Give us more and more courage every day. Every day for 2023, just more courage. More courage, Lord, to walk in places that we're unsure of. To trust you like we never have. I just pray for a just an incredible sense of boldness and courage to come upon each person that's here, each person online, a newfound courage. We'll walk with you, Lord. Show us the way in your time. 
we'll do all that we can to return all glory and thanks and all the credit to you because from you are all things and to you are all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll finish up the series next week, the last two pieces of armor. So I hope that you can make it or you can join us online. And uh, we've got a lot going on today. You can get your meals on your way out. Ladies, please come tonight. They always have the best time. I may or may not be helping with cleanup of the food. Um, I have my own way of cleaning up. But uh, please do come. And Wednesday night, we have a spot for everybody. And otherwise, we will see you next Sunday. Thank you again for being here. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. May you be a light in the darkness. Amen. We love you.